Today we continue our series, Love Dates and Heartbreaks. Now I'm going to skip over the dates, which would normally be the next uh, part of this series, because Josh is going to kick that off next Sunday uh, in the first of two sermons on that subject. I'm, I'm going to finish that thought two weeks from today, uh, but today I'm tackling heartbreaks. Now let me say, let me preface this, because it was weird in the first service for a little bit. Um, it's going to be a little bit heavy content. You say, why are you doing that on Mother's Day? Because mothers are all about the family. And anything that we can say to help uh, their families, they're all in. And that seemed to be the response that I got from everyone that was uh, on the way out today. Uh, But it's going to be a little heavy in the middle to kind of lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about. And uh, But we're going to end on a high note. So hang in there for the big finale. Amen? Let, let me preface the sermon by saying I'm not here to make any uh, empty patronizing promises. Uh, you guys are far too smart for that, so I'm not going to do that. You'd see right through it. But if you're in a season of heartbreak, there are two things that I definitely want you to leave here knowing and have, having confidence in today. The first is this. A broken heart does not mean that you are broken. You need to snap out of that because even if you have a broken heart, you don't have to walk around like you are broken. Your broken heart doesn't have to break your spirit. Second, I want you to know there's a purpose for you even when you lose hope in your dreams. Uh, we all hope our dreams are going to come true, but sometimes we come to a place and we realize, hey, what I thought was going to happen is not going to happen for me, okay? Uh, and listen, this is so important. When your hope fades for that specific dream, uh, you, you need to hear this. That one dream, that one may not come true, but don't let that lost dream squeeze the hope out of you. Are y'all okay out there? Don't let that lost dream squeeze the hope out of you because you can dream again. You can dream again, and the person who goes on living a faith-filled life will see their dreams realized somewhere down the road. Don't lose hope. Don't stop dreaming. Can I have affirmation to that? The reality is this, most of us enter adulthood with a picture of how life is going to be or how we hope that it will be, uh, right? We kind of have a plan laid out. We all have dreams and plans. Most of us even have a schedule for our lives. I mentioned this in first service, and again, I don't get permission when it's family stuff. I just tell you all this. Uh, But Micah was dating a girl, or a girl was real sweet on him, and he kind of was looking her way uh, years and years ago. And uh, she made the mistake of telling him in front of a group of people her life plan. And it was, uh, you know, she said, I'm going to graduate by this date. I'm going to be married. And she looked at Micah, I'm going to be married by this date. And Micah said, see ya. You know, he checked right out of that thing. But people check the boxes. I want to start a business by this date. Uh, I want children by this date. I want to be able to retire when I'm this age. This is particularly true relationally. No one envisions their future alone. Some of our dreams, you know, they do come true. Some of our dreams come true. Some dreams come true for a while. And then at some point, we realize certain dreams are not going to happen for us. You know, we had a plan and it just doesn't materialize. Sometimes we're to blame ourselves. We're to blame. Uh, Sometimes we're partially to blame. Uh, Maybe you did everything right. You followed the rules and you lived by the book, so to speak. But for whatever reason, a relationship never materialized. Maybe they didn't live uh, by the book. Or, Or things looked promising for a while until you got that phone call Maybe you intercepted a text or found that note. You were by the book, but he or she wasn't living their life by the book. Or out of nowhere, uh, you get that, you know, that hard, difficult conversation. I just want to be friends, you know, whatever that it looks like. It was sure more, you know, you're thinking it was sure more than friends last Friday night. I'm just going to throw that out there and let that simmer for just a moment. (laughs) Now... Or, or maybe she's, a, she's discovered a, a different narrative for her life and, and she's, she's going to pivot and her pivot doesn't include you in her future. Uh, maybe in spite of those vows, your second marriage is beginning to feel a lot like your first one to which some, of, you know, some people would respond, second marriage, I'm still looking for the right one, Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. Uh, I'd like to have that first experience of marriage. To make matters worse, 
everybody else's dreams are coming true. At least that's how you feel. Everybody else's dreams are coming true. Even the people who are far less deserving than me is what you're thinking. And you feel that you're deserving, but it's not happening for you. You know they didn't do everything right because you know a lot about them, but still their dreams are, are you know, they're, they're happening and they're coming true. They didn't behave. They didn't wait. They made horrible choices and hurt people all along the way, but still their dreams are happening for them. They're being material in their lives. And worse still, when you look at, at their life and you see the details, maybe because you know them very well, suddenly you see it, it punches you right in the mouth. The very people who didn't follow the rules, who didn't live by the book, they're living your dream. They've taken, they've taken the details of your life and it's just working out for them. If you're in that season, look, I'm going to tell you something. It is a painful season to walk in. And I want to say it, and I want to say it from my heart. I am sincerely sorry because there's, there's few things that rival that kind of brokenness and that kind of heartbroken uh, seasons that people have to go through. And I don't like to see anyone walk through a dark relational valley. And even worse, to feel that they're having to do it or go it alone. That's a challenge. And, and you already know this, but, but if you're in that dark, dark place right now, there's not one thing that I'm going to say today that's going to take your pain away, not if you're in it right now. Uh, but listen, if you're a Christian, you should know that the women and men who brought us the life and teaching of Jesus, the men and the women who shaped Western civilization, there's no arguing that. Uh, Paul is given credit as having the most influence in, in Western culture. We're no strangers to broken hearts. These people were no strangers to broken hearts and dreams that would not come true. They had a plan and their plans didn't materialize. But what is undeniable, as it turns out, they were not cursed, they were blessed. They weren't cursed, they were blessed. They were not broken, they were chosen. They didn't choose the hand that they were dealt, but they chose to trust the hand that dealt it. And they faced the same difficult questions that you and I wrestle with today. And the hardest thing, I believe, to contemplate, and they had to deal with it just like you and I have to deal with it these days, which is this. And we, if we've never verbalized it, we've at least thought it, most everybody in the room, it goes something like this. God, you could have altered my circumstances for me and avoided, helped me to avoid all this pain, this relational pain, just like you did for him or her. You did it for them, and they took a right turn, and I took a left turn, and, and it worked for them, and it's just falling apart for me. Why not me, God? Why not me? I was there when you, you helped them avoid the heartbreak, but you let me crash and burn. And these incredible first century Jesus followers, they accepted the hand they were dealt and never pushed away from the hand that dealt it. They, they played a major role in shaping Western civilization. So again... Even though your dreams may be lost, even though your heart is broken, there's always a purpose for your life. You, you will just, you, you know, you, if you will just have the courage to keep your hands, your heart, and your mind open to our Heavenly Father. And that's how I want to end today. And that's not the ending, but that's how we're going to end, okay? Uh, some of y'all were like, oh, goody, not yet. Hang on. God keeps accomplishing His will in the world through broken-hearted people whose personal dreams, uh, you know, went, they, they had a will, but God said, here's my will, I need you to make this turn. And when they did that, they fulfilled great and mighty things for God, even though they had to abandon their personal plan. Now, one of the most famous people who experienced this was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Again, shout out to all the beautiful mothers in the room and those watching online. Uh, but Mary had her life turned upside down, and her reputation was shot. You know the story very well. Uh, but people, you know, there were whispers. There was gossiping. There was jeers. You know, it kind of went like this. A child conceived by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Man, that, I don't believe that for a minute. When Jesus was born, everywhere Mary went, there was whispers. Now a prophet comes to Mary when Jesus was uh, very, very young. And he told her that he had a word from God for her. So, you know, here, here's Mary, and here's, here's the word. A sword will pierce your soul. A sword will pierce your soul. I think Mary would have pushed back. You know, if, if, if we had been in Mary's shoes, most of us would have pushed back from that prophet and said, wait a minute, I've already endured a major change in my life plan when God sent me the last message he gave. 
right? Remember the one where I was going to conceive a child even though I'd never laid with a man? That was sort of a big deal, Mary could have said, right? Now, now you're telling me I, I've come to a place, I'm going to come to a place in a time in my life where everything will be in upheaval again? Come on, man. Why are we doing this again? That's how people, you know, in our circles would have responded, right? The prophet said, a sword will pierce your soul, but Mary, you're not going to be abandoned. Don't ever think God has abandoned you. You're not going to be cursed. God has not cursed you. God has chosen you. You're highly favored and blessed among women. Mary's response to all of this, this next big season of her life, to the redirection that her life would be nothing like she had hoped it would be, nothing that she planned for was I am the Lord's servant. Man, I am the Lord's servant. There's others in the scriptures and history that has similar testimonies. When John the Baptist, who set the stage for Jesus, realized that his 15 minutes of fame was about to end poorly, it was about to end abruptly, and it was going to end violently, he responded to the news by saying, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. In other words, whatever God deals me is how I'm going to deal. On the night of his arrest, Jesus himself prayed and said, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Wouldn't it be awesome? It would be awesome. Nothing short of amazing to see people in our day respond like this when their life plan is drastically altered and they suddenly realize their dreams are not going to come true. But more often, you and I have seen people panic. We've been those people, right? When things change that we had planned and kind of set in stone, all of a sudden we realize it's not going to happen. We've seen people panic. We've seen them resist. We've been those people. We've pushed back. I've seen people allow fear to inform their decisions. I've talked with people who lose faith and give up and sink their claws into what's convenient and what's available at the time. Whew, that's two weeks from now. But I'm telling you, that's not a good idea, okay? It's just not a good idea to go that route. They say yes to anyone or anything. I've seen what happens when they try to make something happen. Have you ever seen this? It wasn't happening for them, so they tried to kind of force it to happen. Oh, don't, look, I can't get to it right now. Don't do that. Don't do that. The de their desperation led to greater despair. On the flip side, the most remarkable people I've ever met are those whose dreams didn't come true. Their life didn't work out the way that they had hoped and the way that they had planned that it would. That there are people who remain open and available to the possibilities God has for them, although that they don't line up with their plans for their own lives. They said, you know, whatever God chooses for me is the way I'm going to go. You've known these people. They refuse cynicism, bitterness, and they refuse to take on anybody's labels that they try to put on them. Now, let me be really straightforward with you, okay? I believe part of our problem is this. There's a little prosperity gospel in all of our lives. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. On some level, we all hope for a very simplified life. We hope for a simplified faith that says, name it and claim it, believe it and receive it, blab it and grab it. Yeah. Since, since I did all that, you know, I did everything in the prosperity gospel God is committed to my will for my life because I checked all those boxes. Maybe the version of Christianity you were raised on uh, came in, in that wrapper. It looked a lot like that. Here's the, here's the problem. Not only, listen to me now, not only is that bad theology, but it's really hard. It's really, really hard to remain faithful to God when you believe like that, when he doesn't seem to be following through on his side of the prosperity gospel. Uh, some years ago, there was a very well-known prosperity preacher, and I kind of tracked along behind him because some of the things he said was so out there. But he basically, his, the, to sum up, sum up his ministry uh, philosophy and theology, it was like this. If you do that, God has to do this. You give God $100, he's obligated to give you 1000 If you do the stuff that's on this list, if you check all these boxes, God's obligated to heal your body or whatever you're suffering with. You do these things, and God is under obligation to take care of you and respond in this way. As if to say, God's will for our lives can be averted, and our will for our lives takes pres precedence when you check these particular boxes on this list. Do all this, and God's will will surrender to your will. It's not true. It's just not true. And, and, and when 
this particular minister passed away of cancer, a disease that he told people that he was not going to die from, and, and he made all these proclamations. Some, some of his most prominent f- followers, very big-name people that people in, in the Christian circle knew, uh, they began to leave the faith. They began to leave the faith. They, they were writing blogs, and it broke my heart to see the bad theology was devastating other people's lives as well, but they wrote books on why they no longer believed there was a God. God didn't honor his promise and his, you know, his word that they had been taught. Uh, they had been taught God's will surrenders to yours. If you do certain things, God is on the hook, and he has to do this stuff. Again, it's not how God works. It's just not. Uh, that version of Christianity is easy to walk away from. And people do it all the time. The God who doesn't allow bad things to happen in the world, that God does not exist. You cannot manipulate God to do your will in spite of his will. It it doesn't play out that way. That has never been who God is. And I tell you guys this all the time. And this is the greatest point that I could possibly make on this. At the center of Christianity stands Jesus the Christ. Follow me now, Savior of the world and the best person to ever step foot on this planet. Come on now. And the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person. Come on. Jesus did not offer us an equation. He offered us an invitation. It was an invitation to lose our lives so we could find the true life that he wanted us to have. Then he modeled that for us. Y'all okay? He modeled that for us when he laid his life down and he took it up again. Then he extended the invitation and said, follow me. Not because of of what he would do. Uh, He said, follow me because of who I am and what I have already done. Uh, This has been the standing invitation from the beginning of Christianity. Now, this is the invitation that's been accepted by so many broken-hearted people. People whose dreams would not come true. And this is what countless Others have discovered this is where peace is found. This is where peace is found. This is how you live your life with your hands open. This is how you live from the standpoint like Mary and John and Jesus, thy will be done. David learned this the hard way. I love the story. Uh, The information I'm going to give you behind what he ultimately said toward the end of his life When he was in his 60s, his heart had been broken yet again. And he makes an incredible statement that summarizes this whole idea better than anything else that I could find in Scripture about this particular issue. His story is what actually makes his statement at the end so extraordinary. David shows up in Scripture as a shepherd boy, right? You know his story? When he's anointed to be the future king by the prophet Samuel, later at the young and tender age of 15, maybe 16 years old, he kills Goliath. And man, all of a sudden, things escalated at a high pace for him. Goliath, who was terrifying the armies of Israel, overnight, young David becomes a living legend, a folk hero. Later, he's invited into the king's palace where he meets King Saul's daughter. She was hot, okay? So Saul offers David, his daughter's hand in marriage, David says, okay, you know, he's, he's in, I'll, I'll do that. She was stunning. So he marries King Saul's daughter. David has already been anointed king. Everything in his life plan, he's checking all the boxes. It, it couldn't be going any better for David. Man, this thing is really cool. He's got a beautiful wife now. He's already been anointed as a future king, and, and, and it's just getting better and better. Now he can come and go as he wants into the king's castle, and his life is good. He's all set. Saul eventually, because David's fame continued to rise, he became more popular among the people than even King Saul, and Saul got jealous. Next thing you know, David, his son-in-law, who married his daughter, is on King Saul's hit list. He want, he's hunting him like a dog. He wants him dead. He wants him gone. In the next chapter, in the next season of David's life, we see David running for his life because he will not raise his hand against the, the setting king. He said, God put him there. It's not my place to take him out. Only God can do that. I will not raise my... He could have. David was a mighty warrior, right? He could have easily taken Saul out, but he refused to do it. So he leaves with nothing, and now he's a fugitive. His future gets very dark. He's alone. He's abandoned. He panics, and he runs to the village of Nob, where his friend, the priest Ahimelech, lives. And David asks Ahimelech a, a stunning question. He says... Do do you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon, 
because the king's message was urgent, or his mission was urgent. In, in other words, David lies. He, he takes up lying. He, he left in such haste he didn't have time to pack a bag, get a weapon or a spear, but he lies to Ahimelech who was loyal to King Saul to get some help and to get a weapon for war so that he could defend himself. He, now he needs, he needs food and a weapon. And, and look, folks, i got to be honest with you. Isn't that what most people, including you and I, isn't that what we do? When our hearts are broken and our life is falling apart, we're scratching and we're clawing, and you know everything that can go wrong does go wrong. The bottom is falling out. We don't know which way to go, right, left, in between. How do we go over, under? What are we going to do? We've crashed and hit a wall. We don't know what to do, but we have not yet leaned into faith. We're going to figure this thing out. That's kind of what David said. i got to figure this out. i got to fix this problem. And, and we often leave God out of the equation because we think the burden to fix it is on us. So David is, is like, I'm, I'm going to fix this. I need a weapon. So he's relying on his own strength. Something very dramatic happens next. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. Ahimelech brings out Goliath's sword. It's a visual aid. Think about this now. It's a visual aid and reminder of God's faithfulness and protection to David in the past. David had taken Goliath's own sword after he felled him in the valley. He took his own sword and decapitated him in front of all the enemy Philistine army. And there's that sword that he cut Goliath's head off with now being presented to him by Ahimelech. Now here's the problem. David is not looking back and remembering everything God had already done for him. He's just worried about the here and now and what's going to happen in the future. He's already forgotten about every provision God made in the past. He's not thinking about all that. He's looking forward, and looking forward is dark, and it's hopeless in his eyes. He's literally taking matters into his own hands. Verse 9, David said, there is none like it. I remember that sword. Give it to me because I need to take care of this. Instead of protecting David's life, Goliath's sword sealed Ahimelech's fate. King Saul learned that uh, Ahimelech had aided David, his arch enemy, his nemesis, who who Saul believed was trying to overturn his, his rule as king. He was so angry about this that he had Ahimelech, the priest, and the other 85 priests that lived in this village of Nob slaughtered, including their wives, their children, even infant children were killed because of Saul's rage and jealousy. The entire village was wiped out. And all this happened because David told his friend Ahimelech that he was on a mission for King Saul. He lied to him, right? He absolutely lied to him. His lie caused the death of 85 priests and all of their families, this horrendous slaughter in this village. Now, when David hears about this, he's absolutely devastated. He realizes what he's done. Everything about his life became exponentially more complicated because everyone knew that he had lied. Not only did David know his lie, but everybody else knew that he had lied and was to blame for what happened to his friend Ahimelech and everybody else that was slaughtered in the town of Nob. After some time, we're we're fast-forwarding a little bit just to get to the point. After some time, David eventually becomes king. Years later, in his 60s, he finds himself in an eerily similar situation. David's favorite son, the one that he loved above all others, Absalom, is very angry with David because David's daughter and Absalom's sister, Tamar, had been uh, viciously raped. And David, instead of taking vengeance on the person that perpetrated the rape, he just kind of chose to look the other way. And Absalom could not stand the thought of it. He couldn't stand the thought of his sister being raped. And he said it in his mind that he was going to take vengeance uh, on the person that had raped his sister, Tamar, and that he was going to plan his rebellion against his own father, David. Now, Absalom's been plotting uh, against his father for four years, and he keeps it a secret. He keeps it on the down low. And he's secretly raising an army. He's secretly stealing the hearts of the people. He was appointed as a judge, and people would come to him with disputes. And instead of, you know, judging fairly and ruling for one, he would somehow find a way to rule fairly for both, and so that they both walked away going, oh, what a great... What a great judge he is, and oh, we love him. He was just trying to make everybody happy, right? So that's kind of how he was ruling, to steal the hearts of the people. And then all of a sudden, at his time, in his timing, he finally declares himself as king. 
He declares himself as king. He marches on Jerusalem in a rebellion against the father who loved him unconditionally, who didn't have a clue that all this stuff was going on. So to spare the citizens and to spare, you know, to, he, he's, David is heartbroken by this uprising and this rebellion. And to, dis, to spare the city, he says, I'm just going to leave for now. We're not going to have bloodshed in, in here, you know, against my own son who I love uh, uncompromisingly. So he flees. He abandons the people to keep casualties of this uprising at a minimum. When David and his entourage are leaving the city... The people come out in their mourning. He was a great king, a mighty warrior. It led them in victory after victory. Now they're mourning his departure. The whole countryside, the Bible says, wept aloud as all the people, all those people that are leaving with David, passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. Again, David's future gets awfully dark, and he's a fugitive. He had a plan, and things aren't going the way he thought. He's at war with his son Absalom. He's already lost two sons, and now he's about to lose the one that he loved greater than any other. Have you ever felt like this in your life? Think about it. I mean, has everything that can go wrong possibly gone wrong? Have you ever felt like you were headed out to the wilderness? Your security is gone. I mean, the people that you love, that you thought were loyal and faithful to you, you found out they've been lying to you the whole time. Come on now. They've been lying to you and hiding stuff from you and doing some ugly things against you behind your back. You didn't see it coming. And from out of nowhere, they knocked your feet out from under you. This was David's story. It was his story. And then there's a twist. The plot thickens. Zadok was there too. He was a priest. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. On their way out, Zadok is like, hey, let's not forget the Ark. We must go and get the Ark and take it out with us. We can't leave it behind. It has to go with us. Why would they take the Ark? You know the story. There's been literally movies made about this because the Ark represented the presence and the power of God. If you had possession of the Ark, it was as if to say, God is on our side. You could march into a town and say, you better surrender. God is on our side and they'd say, we don't believe you, we're ready for a fight. Have you seen the ark? Because the fame of the ark and the power that it, it wielded was known throughout the regions. And they would be like, oh, you're right, we're not going to resist. You can have the city, you can have the gold and everything that we have. Uh, we're absolutely going to surrender all this to you. But David, uh, suddenly, the, the just saying God is on our side, it, it was a way to manipulate outcomes and convince people. But something's about to happen here. If the king is being forced out of the city, Zadok is saying, if we take the ark with us, they'll believe that God's favor is gone too. Trouble is coming to Absalom because not only has the king left, but God's presence and his power has walked out as well. But David had learned his lesson. He was through trying to manipulate outcomes. He wouldn't do that anymore. He had tried to do it twice. Once as a young fugitive and again as a middle-aged king attempting to cover up his own adultery. And the aftermath of each one of these led to bloodshed and humiliation. David had learned a lesson. And I want you to see the application of this because it relates to everybody in the room and everybody watching online. David steps up and this is basically what he says. He said, I'll not try to force my will on God or manipulate him to do what I want him to do. This is incredible. Look at this. Then the king said to Zadok, take the ark of God back into the city. Amen. Take it back to the city? I'll no longer try to manipulate God to do my bidding. I'm going to live the rest of my days under God's will, not my will. Not mine ever again. I'm not negotiating with God anymore. I'm going to surrender to God. And what David said next is for everyone in this room and everybody that's watching this, this service, if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. In other words, I will rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. This is an interruption in my dream, David would say, but not God's plan. God's will be done. David was saying the rebellion led by the son that I love has caught me completely off guard. He said, I am heartbroken. I don't even know what steps to take. This caught me by surprise. But David's actions say it did not catch God by surprise. It did not catch God by surprise. This wasn't the way I wanted my life to go. This wasn't my plan. 
Zadok the priest can't believe this. He's like, why would you leave the ark in the city for your rebellious son to claim as his own? Then he can step up and tell the people, see, they tried to take the ark and they couldn't, so God's favor now rests on me as king. Don't do it, David. Don't do it. Take the ark. God's presence with us. God is obligated to us. He's obligated. Name it, claim it, believe it, receive it, blab it, grab it. God is obligated to us. If we have possession, if we check this box and we can say, oh, but we have the Ark of the Covenant. The king in verse 27 also said to Zadok the priest, do you understand? Do you understand? Go back to the city with my blessing. You're not abandoning me. Nobody's going to accuse you of walking out on King David. Take the Ark back to the city. He continues, so Zadok and Abathar took the ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. But David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. He's brokenhearted. His head was covered and he was barefoot. He was mourning with a broken heart. He had lost three sons and now it looked like he was going to, you know, he was going to lose another, his, his dignity. He had lost his kingdom. He had lost his dream. But somehow he had not lost his confidence in God. He had maintained that through everything that had gone on. He didn't abandon God even though it appeared that God had abandoned him. And I'm talking to somebody in the room. I don't know who you are. You may think that God has abandoned you, but God is not a million miles away. The great apostle Paul stood on Mars Hill, and he told the people that were worshiping God inappropriately as though he was a million miles away. He said he's not a million miles away. Seek for him and feel for him. He is not far from every one of us. And I want to tell you, in your trouble, in your storm, in this dark season of your life, God is not a million miles away. Hold on. Help is on the way. Amen? Amen. Amen. He had seen where fear, panic, and quest for control leads. This time, David didn't reach for Goliath's sword. It was still in his possession, but he didn't reach for it. This time... He didn't take matters into his own hands. This time, he didn't anchor his faith to the fulfillment of his dreams. Before I move into my closing this morning, let me say it again. If you anchor your faith to the fulfillment of your dreams, if you only are going to believe in God if life works out the way you want it to, as long as things are going good, I'm all in. But boy, if God pivots on me, I'm out. I'm going to check out. I want to tell you, if you anchor your faith to the fulfillment of your dreams, when God's plan for your life collides with your personal preferences or will, you will also push away from the table of the Lord. Inappropriately choosing to believe that God has abandoned you when in reality you have taken matters into your own hands and pushed away from God. Can I ask you to consider this invitation? Here it is. Trust God in the dark seasons of life and trust God in the storms. We have all, there's there's some incredible testimonies in this room and there's some incredible testimonies of cross pointers that are watching online. We, We have all been through some dark seasons. Would you be willing then like David, Mary, Jesus, and the many other people sitting around you and the hundreds that watch us each week online? There, there are people that you go to church with every week that when they stood in front of God and witnesses and in front of an altar and a minister and will you, I do, I do, and they had a plan and a purpose. And all of a sudden, they're heartbroken after just a short season by a spouse who wouldn't stay and work through a problem, who just packed up and left without hanging in there and just walked away. And look, I'm not trying to remind you of the darkest season of your life. I want to take what we've been through and some of us have suffered through, and I want to offer hope to those that are there right now. So I'm asking for you to indulge me just a little bit. I'm not trying to poke you. I'm trying to encourage you. There are people that attend this church that have stood at gravesides of their children. They're, they've buried their, their infants and their toddler children, more than a few. And it, it's devastating. And, and I want you to know about those that have lost marriages that they planned that was going to spend the rest of their life and those that, that, that believe God gave them children to raise and nurture. I want you to know something. They're still here. They're still worshiping God. They're still trusting that God has a plan for their life and that someday they'll be reunited again. There's people that you go to church with that have lost fortunes. They've 
lost every material thing of value. Bankruptcy jumped up and bit them. Everything was going great, but then all of a sudden their business just went under. From out of nowhere, the bottom fell out. There are people that are consistently and faithfully worshiping God every week. Who, some who can't be here. They're having to watch online because of health issues. They're high, high risk, and they're very uh, prone to sickness and disease because of sickness and disease. And their body is failing them, but guess what? They haven't pushed away from the table of God. They continue to lean in and trust Him, just like Mary, just like John, and just like Jesus. All of these folks that have endured some unimaginable, unthinkable Pain, heartbreak, and loss are still here, worshiping God and trusting His plan and His will for their lives. And they're going to declare with David, Here are my dreams, Lord. Here are my plans. Do with them as you wish, and do to me whatever seems good to you. I'm not here to bargain. I'm not here to try to manipulate you, to abandon your will and lean into mine. You know my desires, but I acknowledge your right to rule. A few closing statements and then I'm done. A broken heart, let me remind you, a broken heart does not mean that you are broken. Don't give in to that kind of thinking. Sun's going to shine again. Your best days are not behind you. I don't care what he did to you or what she did to you. Your best days are not behind you. There are people in the room that have lived through those dark seasons. And if you could sit down with them, they would tell you, don't you dare give up. Don't you dare give up. You may be in a dark place right now, but God's love and His light is going to open doors for you you never dreamed or imagined possible. The men and women who brought us the story of Jesus didn't remain faithful because of what they hoped would happen. They remained faithful because of what had already happened. God became flesh and dwelt among them. He disrobed Himself of His deity and He clothed Himself with humanity to demonstrate that He was for them and to demonstrate that He is for you. God's not against you. The devil will get on your shoulder and he'll start telling you because you're in a dark place, see, God has abandoned you. God has not abandoned you. Don't you give in to that lie. This is life. This is the problem of of a, a world that fell and prayed to sin. Many, many, many years ago. This is the curse that fell upon all humanity. But it's not going to end that way. It's not going to end under a curse. As sure as I'm standing here, the trumpet of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ, my Bible tells me, shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be. The promise of God, the blessing and favor of God comes to many people in this life. Some folks are not going to see it come full circle until we see Jesus. But don't you dare give up. God is for you. He is not against you. At the center of our story as Christians stands the best possible man who deserved the best possible life and chose the worst possible end for every one of us. You see, when Jesus cried out, I've said this before, and I want to remind you, when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. The devil and legions and hordes of hell celebrated. Yes, we did it. We beat him. We've won. Jesus was just declaring that his work that he was sent to earth to do was finished. He was about to step into the grave and conquer death for all of eternity. On the first day of the week, he rose. Can you imagine Hallelujah. Can you imagine what the devil must have thought when the ground began to shake and the earth began to quake and all of a sudden the stone is rolled away? Can you imagine what the devil and his legions must have thought when they realized it is finished didn't mean it was over. It meant it's only just begun. Now the real work is going to happen. Hey, don't you give up too soon. The disciples went into hiding for fear, thought this, that was their worst day, but the best was still to come. Can somebody say the best is still to come? Amen. It really, really is. When your heart is broken and dreams can't come true, that's the time to lean in, look up, and reach out. Reach out to the God who has your whole world in his hands. That's the very opposite of what we feel like doing in a dark season, but it's the best next step you can possibly take. Lean into your faith. Trust God. He will come through. That's the time that we are 
challenge the most, but it's the time that we ought to be able to pray with David and the millions of others that have come after him. Matter of fact, would you stand? Let's practice this prayer together, and then I'll let you pray it in your own way. They're going to put it up on the screen for me. And uh, I want us to read it together in full voice. Would you, would you put a little something into this? Beautiful crowd in the room today. Put a little something into this. Lord, I offer you my dreams and plans. Come on, let's start again. Lord, I offer you my dreams and plans. Do to me whatever seems good to you. I acknowledge your right to rule. Your will be done in me. God's not trying to hurt you. God is trying to help you. He has a plan for your life. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This is what we've all been invited to do when it appears that our dreams are not going to come true. You may have been broken. You may have a broken heart, but you are not broken. You may have heartbreak that is unbearable in this season, but you don't have to be a broken person. There is hope beyond the pain that you're living in right now. Don't you dare give up. You get the help that you need. Let us help you. If you're in a dark season, don't stay there by yourself. We can help shine a little light for you in that dark place and get you to where you need to go and where you need to be and offer you the support that you need right here. You have an incredible church family that's here for you, and we want to help you. Don't you walk out. Don't push away from the table of the Lord. It is time. Come on now. It is time to lean in. It's time to lean in and let God look up and reach out. Father, would you speak to the hearts of the people in this room and those that are watching online, pray a special blessing, Father. Help us, God, for those that are broken. I know there's mothers in the room that are so disappointed because they feel like their children have pushed away from faith and and they wanted a different outcome for their life. Lord, I want you to, to, to just speak into their spirit today that it ain't over. It's not over yet. That your call is going to go out, Father. Your promise is, Lord, to reach out and and poke their spirit and draw them back in. And so we're just praying, Lord, thy will be done. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And I pray, Father, that all of this comes full circle. Bless those mothers, those praying mothers that love so unconditionally. Give them strength, Lord, to persevere and to move on and trust you with whatever's going on in the lives of those children that they have literally been willing to give their lives for. Let them leave here encouraged, knowing that it ain't over in Jesus' name. I pray for every person in the room that's struggling. Maybe they're in a relationship that has fallen apart and they're, they're just heartbroken. Father, please let them know that even if this dream doesn't materialize, even if this darkness is a reality for a season it didn't come to stay it will eventually pass and you will let the light of your love shine again and I pray for it to be done in Jesus name let everybody leave here encouraged trusting and believing in Jesus name I love you more than you know thank you for being a part of this incredible day at cross point keep Jesus in your heart and heaven on your mind can I get a witness let's praise God on our way out today amen